So a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful sunny morning. Um, I'm Lorraine Wood, I'm the director of ARENA and I'm delighted to welcome you to ARENA's virtual event, the power of plant-based opportunities within hospitality. And we're very grateful for our sponsor today, Nestle Professional, with their garden gourmet range. Um, today's event is in two parts. So for the first 10 minutes, we'll be looking at industry trends within the plant-based arena uh, before then moving on to the second part, which will be a panel discussion looking at what trends operators are seeing, how they're adapting their menus to the rising consumer demand for plant-based and the importance of communicating that offering correctly and what they think the future will hold. So during the panel discussion, there is the opportunity for you to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Please post the questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box if you can. Um, and then we'll actually go through the questions at the end of the discussion and put them to our panel. So we're now on to the first part of our webinar. Um, and can I please welcome Nestle Professionals Category Manager of Food, Rohini Alam. Rohini's actually got 14 years experience in the FMCG industry. And in her current role, she has successfully launched the company's plant-based brand, Garden Gourmet, into food service. So welcome, Rohini, and over to you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I will just take a second to share my screen. So hopefully you should be able to see that right now. Right, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the power of plant-based and the opportunities that this category um, brings to our industry. And, um, you know, it's been rising over the last years. We want to understand a bit about consumers' motivations for choosing plant-based and how operators can unlock growth opportunities with plant-based food. Um, I'll also share a little bit about um, key elements to drive success and how we can support um, anybody in being a part of the plant-based journey. So without further ado, um, this is something that's not necessarily new news, but I find it every time I look at it, it's just incredible that 44% of Americans, 65% of Europeans and 42% of Chinese are saying that they want to reduce their meat intake. So plant-based is really for everybody. It's no longer just for vegetarians or vegans. And more and more people are becoming flexitarian in their eating habit, meaning that they're choosing to reduce their meat consumption in some of their meals. And they're not necessarily identifying as flexitarians. This is probably a term that we've, you know, within the industry um, picked up. But the main thing is there's a fundamental shift to how people are interacting with plant-based food. And there's a shift in people's diets. This is absolutely not one of those trends or fads that you see coming and going. And the pandemic, if anything, has actually made plant-based as a category even more relevant than ever before, because people have become much more aware and conscious about the link between food and nutrition and overall health. So research indicates that people um, are giving their health much greater focus. And in lockdown, um, they've discovered the positives of plant-based food. In fact, one out of five Britons have cut down their meat consumption during the pandemic, and a half of those trying vegan alternatives saying that they will choose to continue to choose them even after lockdown uh, completely lifts. Um, what, what I found really staggering was that 92% of plant-based meals are actually eaten by non-vegans. And just there's an overall prediction that plant based consumption will be on the steady rise following, um, you know, what we've been through over the last year and a half. And 63% of those aged between 18 to 34 in particular will be scrutinizing what they eat even more carefully because they need they have that need for reassurance when it comes to food and ingredients and what it's doing for them. Now, when we look at then why people are choosing plant-based foods, um, for some, it's about reducing uh, meat because they have health concerns or diet concerns. For some consumers, the impact on the environment of meat is a real concern, and this is especially strong among millennials. Uh, then there's, of course, animal welfare, which is another key reason for people switching to plant-based diets. And for many consumers, uh, religious beliefs are a driving factor for their diet choice because in some religions, certain types of meat is prohibited. 
And the uh, the overall theme is with plant-based uh, meals considered more health, like better for you and better for the planet. Um, this this has become a real big concern for a lot of people. And actually, in the next slide, I'm going to take you through why this has become such a big issue today. So if we like take a quick snapshot into the future, we see that by 2050, the global population is expected to increase by about 20%, which would take our population to about 9.5, 9.1 billion, compared to 7.6 billion in 2018. Now, in order to feed this population, we estimate that we would need to increase food production by 70%. However, there are 55 billion livestock who are consuming food grown on nearly 75% of our land, which means in simple math terms, there's, there's simply not enough land to feed that population on our current diet, which means this needs intervention. Now, there are lots of um, companies are making a lot of great plant-based products and trying to in, in, you know, encourage people to uh, adopt more plant-based products in their diets because plant-based products do have a smaller footprint and they are um, in fact producing plant-based products generates less greenhouse gas emissions uses less water less fresh water consumption and less energy use and of course it's a good contributor to health um, from our point of view in our efforts to prioritize sustainability we've made a commitment to make Garden Gourmet, which is one of Nestle's plant-based brands, a carbon neutral brand by next year. So we're reducing carbon um, emissions throughout various activities. Uh, and we've kind of brought three of those uh, initiatives to share with you today. Uh, the first one is around packaging. So we have moved to packaging that is recyclable by design. With, and, but we're on a journey to keep continuously improving this so that next year we're able to move to paper-based packaging. Um, we've also made changes to the way we source our soy, which is one of the key ingredients in one of our products. Um, we ensure that none of our soy is coming from land that has been deforested. And we've also made a change moving from global to European sourcing. Um, this will st we'll start this with part of our range this year and we'll continue to do it throughout all of 2022. And then finally, we made changes to our supply chain where our Kropka factory, which is the factory where most of the Garden Gourmet products are made, um, that is powered by 100% renewable energy. Um, so just a few initiatives that we've been taking, but I do know that there are some really uh, admirable initiatives being taken by uh, members of our industry. And this is something that will gain more and more momentum. If I then um, have a quick look at what does uh, embracing plant-based food does do for the operator. Um, as consumers demand for plant-based food increases, it's, it's no surprise that plant-based food can improve the perception of a restaurant. And in fact, 73% people think that it improves the perception, the image of a restaurant. And 41% of consumers are actually willing to pay more for a good plant-based dish. Um, just pulling up a few bits, um, offering a plant-based burger on a quick service restaurant menu can make a consumer feel that the restaurant is health, offering food that is healthier, trendier, more progressive and concerned about the environment. And um, the acceleration of plant-based food has really been driven by um, the, the high street chains who've made it, well, you know, plant-based products and dishes um, and just food on the go much more accessible to everybody. So naturally there is a boom of plant-based options on menus, especially through meat replacement products because it's no longer about having to settle for something that's not as delicious. Consumers want something that's equally an equally delicious meat eating experience, except that it has all the benefits of plant-based food. So there was the Greg's vegan sausage launch, of course, uh, the sausage roll. It became one of their fastest selling products and it played a role in contributing to them achieving annual sales of over a billion for the first time. Uh, they had a 13.5% growth versus the year before. 
Pizza Hut had introduced a veganery pepperoni style pizza, which was made from pea protein. And they sold, um, we have statistics of a certain day where they sold 50% um, more than the same time the year before. Oh, and we then also have Lyon, who've introduced Chipotle and avocado burgers. Not only did it sell better than expected, but it was then outselling their animal-based burgers. Um, we also have a lot of interesting innovation here, which doesn't necessarily involve having a meat alternative. So Wagamama introduced a tuna steak that was made out of watermelon. KFC introduced a zero chicken burger. Cafe Nero had a vegan cheesecake. And Subway had a meatless meatball marinara sub, which um, interestingly is actually a garden gourmet product, uh, which is why I can share a bit more stat with you about how that performed for them. Um, so over half of the sales from the meatless meatball marinara sub when it was launched was incremental to quick service restaurants compared to the previous month. And the reason I, I wanted to share this is because there is a, a concern um, if I introduce plant based dishes to my menu, will it cannibalize other parts of my menu? Um, and actually, we've seen that it doesn't cannibalize, but in fact, it brings incremental revenue. So 46% of people who bought um, the Bless Me Bowl Marinara Sub, it was switching from another QSR item, but another 46% was actually incremental to QSR repertoire and 8% were incremental buyers. So completely new buyers coming into uh, the, the restaurant. So in this case, when you add those up, that is 54%, so over half of the sales were coming from, were basically delivering incremental revenue. And that's why we really, you know, strongly recommend that adding plant-based products can have great halo effects. Many quick service restaurants who've launched plant-based products reported an increase in footfall and attracted new customers. Um, these launches also help create a lot of excitement on social media and they give PR coverage. And many consumers claim that they would recommend those dish their, to their friends and families to try those dishes. Um, if I quickly then move on, uh, just a little bit more from me, uh, because I work as a category manager on uh, for Garden Gourmet within Nestle Professional, I thought I'd share a few of the kind of the things that make us uh, really interesting um, as a plant-based uh, provides a product supplier. So we've actually have we have 30 years of expertise in creating plant-based products, and some of the things that we really try to make sure um, we're hitting are delivering on taste and texture. We've got a very versatile meat-free range. The products are created in collaboration with nutritionists and chefs. So they are nutritionally balanced using responsibly sourced ingredients. And they're all certified vegan or vegetarian. They can be cooked in a multiple of ways um, using very flexible methods. And they, we do have some of the cleanest labels in the industry today. And to help promote that, we are offering a cashback campaign currently with all of our wholesale route to market customers where uh, operators can buy any of the Garden Gourmet products and claim cashback. Plus there's a chance to win a, a decent amount of money as well. Um, so just the last slide that I wanted to leave everybody with is um, we're very excited that we got an opportunity to recently collaborate with Julie Klein, who is the founder of Sustainable Kitchen Consultants, to create a plant-based toolkit. So this uh, toolkit has tips and information around the consumer's dietary needs, why uh, now more than ever, if you're not already not on this journey, you should embrace plant-based in your menus and how you can um, appeal to the flexitarian at the, the wider consumer base by having really good plant-based dishes. And of course, we are at hand to support with any anything that you would need to make plant-based a profitable option for you. That's all from me, Lorraine. Brilliant. Thank, thanks ever so much, uh, Rahini. Uh, that was really interesting. And that's very much set the scene for our um, uh, the next part of our webinar, which is our panel discussion. So thanks ever so much, Rahini. That was great. So we're now on You're to welcome. the... My pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. So we're now on to the second part of our webinar this morning, which is our panel discussion. And I'm delighted to welcome our panel host for today, Anita Murray, who is the CEO of William Murray PR and Marketing. Um, for over 30 years, 
She's been helping companies in both retail and hospitality become more successful by thinking and acting differently to get results. Anita is one of the top 150 women in food, drink and hospitality, and as well as running her agency, has been working with myself and Arena, facilitating many of our webinars. Uh, so delighted to have you with me once again, Alita. Thanks, Lorraine. Thank you. Brilliant. So, so we're now on to the fir our first panellist, um, and I'd like to introduce Paul Dickinson, who is the Director of Food for Fuller's Smith & Turner PLC. So Paul is a classically trained chef, and in his role as the first director of food for Fuller's, um, Paul is actually responsible for the progress and performance of over 1,200 chefs, many development at over 200 sites, and food procurement across the multi-million pound business. And next year, very exciting, in 2022, Paul will actually be the England team head coach for the Culinary World Cup in Luxembourg. So, Paul, delighted to have you with us this morning. morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very excited. Thank you. Great, great to have you with us. Um, and we're now on to David. So, uh, David Mulcahy, our next guest and panelist, is the Food Innovation and Sustainability Director for Sodexo UK and Ireland. Uh, David not only has a wealth of industry knowledge, but has gained numerous awards on both the national and international stage. In his current role, he's responsible for enhancing the reputation and recognition of Sodexo, driving initiatives across food development, strategy, sustainability and chef development across the business. Um, and when he's not doing his day job, he too is also busy organising and running many industry-wide competitions and events. And I'm sure many people have seen him in his chef's whites at various events and exhibitions. So welcome, David. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, delighted to have you. Um, next up is our panellist, uh, Salima Vellani, who is the founder of a business called KBOX Global. Now, with a background in corporate finance, strategy consult consulting, venture and building global businesses, uh, Salima is a rare F&B entrepreneur with an international portfolio of restaurants spanning fast casual, casual and high-end lifestyle dining sectors. She's recently moved into the food tech world and founded KBOX Global, which is a unique and fast-growing company in the food technology and delivery space. So it's great to have you here, Salima. Um, thank you for joining us, and I'm sure you'll bring a, a slightly different perspective to today's discussion. Thank um, you. And next we have Lizzie Barber. So Lizzie uh, joined the family business, The Hush Collection, after a brief stint working in film development. Um, and she works alongside her older brother, Jamie Barber, where she is now head of brand. Um, for those of you that don't know, The Hush Collection is London's leading boutique restaurant group, comprising of Hush, Hache and Cabana restaurants. And as well as being the head of brand of the business, she's also the co-founder of Cabana, and is also an award-winning author. And she's written several books, including the Cabana and Carnival Cookbook. So welcome, Lizzie. Great to have you here today. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have Kate Alexander, who is actually representing our sponsor, Garden Gourmet. So great to have you here, Kate. Kate is Head of Commercial Channels for Nestle Professional. Um, she's been working in food service for over 17 years, and she's particularly focused on the growing trend of plant-based products and supporting Nestle Professionals customers in delivering best-in-class products with the Garden Gourmet brand. So great to have you here, Kate. And, Thanks for uh, having me. Great to be with also, you. Brilliant. And thank you very much for sponsoring today's event. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Anita to start our discussion, um, and I'll be back on to wrap up after Q&A. So over to you, Anita. Thanks, Lorraine, um, and uh, hello to all of the panellists. So I'd like to start with um, a, a, a conversation around plant-based being in, in growth, and I'd like to ask the panellists what trends they are seeing within their businesses in terms of the increased demand for plant-based products. Uh, David, hi there. Um, hi. So obviously operates across multiple sites and sectors, including BNI, healthcare, education, and events. So 
what are you seeing in terms of uh, plant-based trends? And is, is plant-based more uh, predominant in uh, some sectors more than others? Uh, hi, Anita, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess firstly, you, you know, as we probably are on the call for that, you know, plant-based has exploded as a, as a topic. And what we're finding is that, you know, we're either meeting the demands or perceived demands of our, our guests and our clients, no matter what the segment. So although we go across segments, certain segments will be naturally more aware of this trend. So how we talk about it depends on and changes depending on the demographics or the age group or the need. So if we're talking, for example, to a junior school pupil or a university student, the language changes too. Um, and I think we know generally, and actually just listening to the news this morning with uh, obviously the, the UK food strategy being unveiled, you know, we know as a nation we're, we're, we're failing around the five a day message and kids generally struggle to eat enough veg. So we have to make the idea of plant-based cool and trendy and appetizing and delicious. And this can mean, to Rahini's uh, presentation earlier, you know, can mean that mirroring of meat type products or vegetables cooked in a way that say, share the same flavors and techniques and te textures as, as meat style lamb products. So if we wanna change those behaviors, we've gotta change our approach. And I think that, that fits into different sectors in different ways. And probably just, uh, we use the word trend on this as well. And maybe, you know, I don't think anymore this is doing that justice because if you look at, and just thinking about, you know, fish and seafood, meat and game, they're known categories. And so plant-based, it's a lot more than fruit and veg. And we've got to, we've got to probably, uh, you know, I guess we agree that plant-based has been redefining how we eat. The idea, the word flexitarianism is still very new, um, but it's been pushed into the modern language now around how we eat and it's moving at, at such a speed and it's really exciting. But I think personally as well, we've got to be careful that we don't get too obsessed with products disguised as something they're not. You know, we should be already eating from a wider plant-based uh, uh, basket of ingredients and preparing and cooking them to achieve delicious results. So a dish that is delicious, but happens to be plant-based, is a goal that we're going for. And we, we do that in different ways across different segments and sectors uh, through our menus. Thanks, David. That was a, a, a great first, uh, first answer. Really appreciate that. And Paul, um, as, as we heard from Lorraine, Fuller, Fuller's owns and operates um, a huge number of pubs, inns and hotels across the south of England. I think that's about uh, almost 400. So what plant-based trends are you seeing across your estate, Paul? Yeah, well, I, 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 I think it's... <laughs> It's as interesting as it gets because I think it comes from all aspects. You know, touching on what David said, it, there's 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 the people within, um, uh, there's the customer, um, and there's expectations. And what I what I mean by expectations is, um, lots of people talk around sort of uh, created products where actually, if you do the basics really well, whether it's serving veg on the table and let children or people make their choice, they'll try something new. But if you can't cook those ingredients properly and do them justice or give them integrity. Then it, you sort of fail already, and I think as children and broccoli is is a great example. But I think in our business we we use the 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 people who are true vegans uh, and follow the cause of animal welfare uh, and get their ideas and get them into our creativity days where chefs pull it all together, um, and that really then helps the message internally about what this is rather than uh, a marketing speculation that sometimes I would say misleads. And you know we we touched on uh, uh, avocados and, and almonds, which we can leave that for later in the discussion. So you know you're doing the right thing, but I think the key thing that we're learning is on our website, so we haven't got one menu. Um, I don't know why we make it really hard, but it's good. Um, customers are about 25% is their first search is a vegan dish, but their conversion of choice in, in our restaurants, pubs and hotels, it only converts to 7% of total sales. So. So when we looked into that, the interesting thing is if you have a vegan dish that sits on a menu for a month, yeah, the sales decline a week after you've had it. So it's it's not about the trend. It's staying on top of the momentum of, of vegan-based dishes or plant-based. And that's what excites people. They want to see something new. They want to see lots of simple cooked ingredients pulled together. Um, and, you know, in, in our business, we, we haven't gone as far as doing a vegan-based bacon or something like that because... Um, 
it doesn't fit within our proposition. But I think, you know, as soon as you've got a beautifully um, vegan Wellington, which, you know, vegan Yorkshire puddings, that's the limit, and vegan gravy, which I was like, how can you have vegan gravy? But I think if we don't have that, the choice and the return of customers lag. So we've just got to keep on top of things. And, you know, I'm a true believer in do the basics really well and give people choice. But as soon as you become complacent, you lose out. So I think the trends is how we keep on top of what we're doing. We innovate and create with our people. Um, and the fun of lockdown, you know, we were doing a chef of the year competition with our front house staff. We were doing competitions with our ops managers. And it's amazing how many people started going back to cooking and appreciating that it takes a lot of hard work and pre preparation to cook a really lovely vegan dish. So I think the respect for, for, for the vegan sort of offer and plant-based dishes has grown. And that's why I feel, you know, going forward, people will, will choose uh, a vegan dish as their reason to visit, but then maybe on the visit, indulge on something else. So, so it really is an interesting, exciting time. But I still think, you know, my message always is if we don't engage with children, then we're going to miss out on that momentum going forward. So, you know, the trends really are, it's a family business. We try to do as much as we can to please everyone without breaking our teams and using innovation within to create that sort of following, which has been fun, uh, but it is stressful. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot. Um, and, and Lizzie, um, you were instrumental in creating uh, Hache's vegan range. And by the way, um, my daughter absolu absolutely loves Beyond Cheese. That's her favourite. <laughs> um, so are you finding that your customers are looking for the next plant-based food offering within the Hush collection? Uh, I guess following on from Paul's comment around innovation. So what I think is interesting is um, about maybe five, six years ago, I gave a um, discussion on digital uh, to marketeers where I said that if you were a restaurant and you didn't have a website, then you should probably go home because it was at that period where this was still kind of a new concept that every restaurant needs to have a website. And now I feel like if you don't have a plant-based or a vegan dish on your menu, you should probably go home. And I think what's really interesting for me is um, we've got three different brands at very different stages of growth um, within our business. So um, Hush has been going for 20 years. Cabana has been going for 10 years. Um, Hache is slightly older, but we acquired the business um, the most recently and Hache was the first one that we really kind of looked at from a plant-based um, point of view and what's interesting for me is seeing how we've now had that knock-on effect to the rest of the business so that we just can't have a menu for Hush which is a much older clientele a much more traditional clientele without having a vegan or plant-based dish on it and similarly with Cabana um, we're now branching out and Cabana is a Brazilian at heart steak and grill restaurant and yet these are still considerations that we have to make um similarly with Hache, we did a lot of development on our vegan range it was incredibly popular and it really kind of shifted the perception of Hache as a burger brand but now what we're seeing is the demand for vegan dishes outside of the core burger range so uh, vegan milkshakes vegan desserts vegan starters um, so i really do think that it is something that our customers are responding to across the whole estate and are wanting to see more of and are hungry for. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, thanks, Lizzie. And um, it was really interesting, Paul, that you mentioned uh, vegan gravy uh, because um, uh, Salima, again, one of the, um, the things that appeals to um, my daughter on your menu is very much the, the vegan waffles with gravy and maple sy syrup. Um, so uh, I think there's a theme going on here. Um, could you tell us please about your plant-based offering uh, within your businesses uh, at Absurd Bird and K-Box Global? Sure, so um, Absurd Bird is a chicken brand. So we, I decided about three years ago um, that I wanted to shift uh, the business to what, this is before K-Box was born, but 50% of Absurd Bird should be vegan. Um, since we've launched K-Box, I've, I've made sure and, and I've got real support from the chefs um, who are not vegan. We've just recently hired um, a vegan chef, uh, but, and he works very closely with a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs. And what we've decided as a company is that every brand that we produce has to have 50% of it has to be vegan. Um, and in the next two years, I want to move the entire company towards a, a hundred percent plant-based so 
what we're finding right now is our audience skews very young because we're focused entirely on food delivery. Um, also within food delivery, people are um, demanding much more indulgent food than they might necessarily when they go out to eat to a restaurant. So we've been focused on, and it's something that's beginning to shift. Um, we've been very much focused on uh, mimicking um, what they would expect if they went to you know, a, a non-vegan uh, restaurant. So whether it's an Indian restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, a burger place, everything that they could get in that restaurant, we want to provide them, but making it plant-based. So we're, we're, very, we're very focused on um, positioning ourselves as emulating existing products. Now, what I want to get towards is moving more to whole, whole food plant-based diet, because um, I believe that's where we should all be aiming for. Uh, right now, people can talk about they want healthy food, but our uh, evidence shows that you put healthy on a menu and actually the sales aren't there. Um, people are talking, uh, what people say and what people order are very, very different things. And that's what we're finding. So what's been really heartening to me, and by the way, anytime we put a plant-based uh, product on our menu, it does extremely well, especially outside of London. And tier, I mean, in London, there's, there, there's so much on offer, but in tier two, tier three, tier four cities, um, very little on offer. And literally, as soon as we put something that's plant-based, just the, the sales go through the roof. So we're seeing a very different trend. We're not seeing reluctance from the consumer. We're seeing consumers are demanding uh, more plant-based food. And I think the easier element for us is the ethnic um, uh, kind of menus because Mexican food, Indian food, you know, African food, Caribbean food does very well. And, and the basis of those cuisines are actually plant-based. So we see um, it's very easy to transition uh, on those kinds of cuisines. Brilliant, thanks Salima. And, and Kate, um, again, we heard from Lorraine that, um, that you work with a, a number of operators in food service and hospitality. And, and what, are you, what are you hearing? What are they sharing with you about the direction of travel for plant-based? Um, um, I, first of all, I hope you, uh, my connection's okay. I keep being uh, thrown out, so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, but I think basically echoing what, what the others have said, we're seeing that across all kind of commercial channels, there's a real appetite to put plant-based on menu. And that's not just because of that's what consumers are demanding, but also it supports os uh, operators' sustainability initiatives. Um, I think we find that some customers actually find that with their operational constraints, um, it's difficult to offer a full vegan experience. So they're definitely looking for suppliers to find solutions to overcome this for them. Um, and I guess there's also that challenge of how you communicate, because we, we know that flexitarians really make up um, the biggest share and they, they, they're the opportunity driving in size. Um, but actually, the vegan community has a really loud voice. So having vegan friendly offer is as important as having a plant based offer. So it's how you communicate that on menu, et cetera. Um, and there are differences, you know, but um, but I think ultimately you can't compromise on taste and texture. So it's really important that you that you have those fundamentals right. Thanks, thanks Kate. Um, now moving on to the, the, the second uh, area for, for, for today's conversation, and that's uh, very much, you know, we've heard about the acceleration of uh, plant-based. So where do suppliers fit into this? Um, you know, how do you choose your products? Uh, and I guess, what are you looking for from your suppliers uh, to, to meet this, uh, this, this accelerating trend? And Salima, can I start with you, please, and ask what you're doing uh, in partnership with suppliers? Uh, yeah, sure. So we were lucky. We we launched um, with ASDA, a vegan butcher, um, at the beginning of this year, which has been fantastic for us because it's enabled us to explore so many different more products than we would have. Um, we are, you know, traditionally people are focused on meat um, and chicken. So we're, we're very focused now on other categories. Fish and seafood is really important to us. So um, we're discovering unbelievable products from all over the world in, in those categories. Um, we, we never really looked at pork um, and, and now we're seeing a lot of kind of pork alternatives. 
uh, and again, you know, you know, I have chefs that are from Mexico, from India, from you know, uh, Northern Europe, and and so they're they're looking to explore um, natural uh, vegetable and, and and legume product that they use in their home countries, and so we're we're bringing that more more into it. But from the food supplier side, it really is um, find that uh, find that gem that no one else has found, right? So find that little supplier. Um, hopefully it's local uh, and, and to distinguish yourself and differentiate yourself. And, and what's amazing is there's an amazing product out there. It's just getting better and better uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, so we look for innovation. Brilliant. Thanks, Salima. And Paul, uh, what can your suppliers do to help you? Um, so yeah, we, we work mainly with, a, you know, in the seasons with the farmers and understand what we've got volume um, and then take it to what we call our scratch kitchens where chefs pull stuff together and, you know, take a, a basic skill and then understand the complexity of, and will we be able to deliver it across lots of different elements of our business because, you know, it's not all food. Food's, you know, a big part of our business and we've got, you know, 1,200 chefs and you know, 120 of our pubs are massive in the sense of the volume, the operation in, in itself. But I think once you've got that sweet spot, it's just working then with the suppliers, what's available. And, you know, I think uh, without getting into the politics of Brexit, I, I think it's made us look closer to home for ingredients. We're already working currently with chefs in the kitchens uh, three days a week, working on what's available going into autumn without going across uh, the waters, relying on challenges of stuff coming through to Europe. And that sort of inspired our people just to do the basics really well. Um, it's amazing. As a child, uh, we used to make uh, pumpkin sort of Halloween things out of a Swede. So when you know when you do something with a Swede, we've even looked at uh, doing uh, Swede-based spaghetti uh, as the base of our spaghetti for the kids' offer, or as a a base of a, a main course dish with a beautiful, simple wild mushroom ragu. So we're just challenging ourselves and all the the classic skills of processes but working with ingredients closer to home but getting the chefs to bring it together because you know there's nothing worse than a culture of chefs who goes I can do something better or I could do this so when you take them on that journey and let them go and touch feel see cook and taste it sort of you know, they're the salespeople, and then they engage the front of house people and the marketing team does all the stuff so it really is going back to basics and, and using the stories of nostalgia to elevate ideas um, and, and, and get the guys to run with it. And I think that's the key thing. So, you know, when I said to the Bordeaux, sweet spaghetti, they just sort of looked at me and I was like, well, I just did you a ragu, uh, a wild boar ragu with pasta. And they go, yeah, well, that wasn't pasta. Oh, well, you said it was gluten-free. I said, I, I did say it didn't contain any gluten, but it was vegetable based. So the perception of something versus when you eat it really is that playing with that mind and bringing the passion to the table. And once you get them to buy into it, it's all of a sudden it's, wow, this is a great idea. Uh, and then the calories fall behind it because that's you know only around the corner. So it really is exciting when you talk about health well-being in something that can be perceived as you know oh it's a vegetarian or it's vegan and bring excitement to it. So it's using all that passion around simple ingredients. And like I said, the Swede has a lot to offer. And, and Lizzie, obviously, when you created the um, vegan range uh, for Hache, um, and, and you're still innovating, um, where do suppliers feed into that process for you? So I think for us, we've almost shifted, particularly with the vegan range, the way that we've worked with suppliers, where we actually find the products that interest us first, similar to what Salima was saying, you know, seek out those kind of really small, exciting companies and then work with suppliers for a route to market. Um, I think it's amazing that when, when we started um, looking at a vegan-based patty for the burgers, the choice was very limited. Beyond Meat didn't even come in, hadn't even come into the UK and we were actually one of the first restaurants to take on Beyond Meat. Whereas now I'm getting messages about new types of plant-based burger patties all the time and you know we have a choice of kind of three or four off the top of my head that we could be working with um similarly with cheese i think um i remember when we first started looking at vegan burgers and a cheeseburger in particular i mean i don't know if anybody remembers those kind of god awful chemical plastic cheeses that you got back in the day that you opened the packet and they kind of stunk out a whole kitchen whereas i think now i've certainly been doing a lot of research and there are some really exciting companies there's one called kind and co um kind of co i think they're called who are just very natural cheese baked well, plant-based cheese products um we use via life for the cheese in the hashe burger and again they are 
a very good alternative to those kind of old school plasticky cheese ranges. So I think it's about finding those really great non-chemical, small, sustainable, preferably uh, based companies who can really elevate the dishes and um, working with suppliers as to how to get these small companies um, into their supply chain and, and be able to supply us effectively. Brilliant, thanks Lizzie. And, and David, for, with Sodex, I imagine you're inundated with um, you know, suppliers looking to work with you. So um, how, how do you work with them to choose the, the, the right products? Well, I guess, I guess uh, for us, it kind of starts with, you know, the fact that we've got a very broad, we've got seven different segments facing into different types of, um, of the industry. So um, ultimately, it starts with, with uh, there's some common factors, you know, we want the right food offers, the right, the right, um, for the right sector. Um, but again, we have, because of the differences, you know, if we're looking at, for instance, in, in education, we know we've got legislation requirements, we know that young students or universities require for instance a, a food court style offer or a global offer so every different type of sector has a different demographic and, and, and type of person in it what we do is we will create a brief for a menu and then the idea is and we look to engage with suppliers and, and to support that and, and I think more and more and particularly for us insight is, is key we, we very much look at I hate to use the word um, you know relying on the science and the data because you've heard that in all the wrong ways over the last year but the idea that you know we must look at the data and understand this is a trend or an emerging uh, trend um, or the way things are going or expectations with gen z etc and so the idea then is at least we have the information to go to a supplier with and also the other way around as rohini just shared you know that kind of insight and that kind of information helps our brief and our understanding of what's what's available but um you know again ultimately we've made some commitments around uh uh from a health and well-being point of view that a minimum of one third of our menus will be plant-based uh, and that goes up against our food waste reductions and carbon reductions so when we're talking to suppliers we need to understand what they can offer that support that kind of um that kind of uh, commitment as well um so from an insight point of view, um, the types of cuisines, the styles of cookery, whether it's grab and go or more and more now, as we're getting more into dark kitchens and micro markets, the, the formats and the ingredients we need and how natural or how, um, uh, how prepared they are depends on that sector. And so we've, we've, got, to, we've got to have good knowledge about what suppliers are able to, um, to provide for us. And maybe just a quick couple of examples. Uh, for instance, we looked at uh, Future 50 was a, an initiative we, we launched um, together with WWF and Unilever. Uh, and that was looking at the world's 50 most sustainable ingredients based on a, a range of uh, you know, low, low carbon footprint, uh, water use, et cetera, all plant-based. And uh, we launched a range of menus across all the sectors using that as a hook. And the chefs, to Paul's point, the chefs were the ones that got involved and they got involved in playing with ideas and dishes and replacing uh, pulses, grains, etc., with more sustainable pulses and grains. Uh, and so the idea is that, you know, if we enjoy eating something that's slightly different, because often people are, you know, they struggle to make that, to make that change, they're more likely to have it in the future. Um, so it's about designing menus together with suppliers. And right now we've just launched a with Nestle in the US, we've just launched an innovation challenge around plant-based uh, called Eat the Street. And we've just been judging some of the, uh, the entries this week. So again, it's bringing some fun into the relationship uh, between our suppliers and ourselves. That's great, David, thank you. Um, it, it's almost like we rehearsed this because uh, my next question is to Kate. So Kate, could you tell us a little bit more about how your Garden Gourmet range is being used uh, on menus? Yeah, and I think, you know, to, to echo David's point about the complexity that he sees in his business, that's the same for many of the operators that we work with. Um, so they're looking for um, versatility. They're looking for flexibility in, in applications as well. So if I take our um, fillet pieces, for example, they can be used in one customer and be used across multiple applications. So you can put them in a curry, you can put them in a pie, you can use them in a grab and go format. And I think that's really important for our customers. Um, 
We've also got customers like Subway that have got a vegan ball in our meatless meatball marinara, which is a bit of a mouthful at this time of the morning. Um, but then also we've got that product being used um, in TGI Fridays in a pasta dish. Um, so I think that versatility and flexibility is, is, is really important. Obviously, as people have mentioned, innovation is key and the re rate of innovation um, is coming through so fast. Um, we're, we're, keep, we're trying to keep up with that. Um, we've got our Manchester City partnership, and that's a great opportunity for us to test um, different offers. Um, so we're using our vegan mints um, across a number of different street food style, style um, applications. Um, and then we've obviously got our sensational burger. So <laughs> Lizzie, it'd be great to talk to you about our sensational burger, um, but that's being used across the uh, across pub groups and, and caterers such as Compass and also Young's pub groups. So so yeah, we're 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 um, kind of focused in that red meat, white meat at the moment. But we under we understand that innovation is is coming, and we'll be looking at different categories. Brilliant, thanks, Kate. Um, I'm conscious we've we've got uh, 15 minutes left, so. Uh, I think we're going to um, rattle through these next uh, uh, couple of uh, discussion areas. So the, the next one I'm moving on to is um, marketing. And I think Paul mentioned earlier about the, um, you know, the growth in um, flexitarianism, et cetera. Um, and, and it's, you know, you've got your vegans, you've got your flexitarians, you've got your vegetarians. And, and a, a question that's always kind of in my mind is, how do you ensure that you don't alienate any of your customers uh, when, when you're talking to them um, about plant-based? So Lizzie, I'm interested in your approach to marketing uh, your brands. So I think with Hashi in particular, obviously it's something that we were very conscious of because we are first and foremost um, a steak, hashed steak burger restaurant. Um, and I think it was when uh, Jamie, my brother, walked into the office and said, I've bought a burger brand. For me personally, I don't eat red meat and I thought there is nothing in this brand. For me, I do a lot of the food development for the restaurants and uh, I literally can't taste any of the, not can't, but I won't taste any of the steak burgers. Um, so I think that over the years, we have really shaken up what a burger restaurant can be. And I think Hashi has always been slightly different from the kind of dude food, meat-based restaurants and that it is a almost like a brasserie style restaurant that happens to serve burgers. And I think that uh, kind of growth in our approach and the kind of broadening of our offering means that we are able to talk to our customers about a whole the whole breadth of our menu the same way that you can have a nice glass of wine and a, a, we've just done a massive load of development on our cocktail range um, so I think we were very concerned when we pushed the vegan range that we would alienate the steak based customers but actually what we found is that yes we've lost some hardcore kind of very steak focused customers but what we've gained is a whole audience and a whole new audience of uh, plant based uh, consumers who wouldn't necessarily come to us because they would have thought um, that they there was nothing in Hache for them. We did a lot of research about um, one person in a group being the detractor for going to a restaurant. So um, if, you, if you've got a group of five people and one of them is a vegan and then there's nothing on the menu for a vegan, then they become the handbrake and consumers will decide to go to a different restaurant. Whereas for us, we're able to provide everything for a group of people who all have different dining habits. And, and I think that that's how we approach this. It's not about marketing a vegan burger or a steak burger or a chicken burger. It, it's about marketing, this is our offering, this is for everyone, whether you're flexitarian, gluten-free, um, don't wanna eat anything at all and just wanna have our amazing cocktails. You know, And I think that that's the way that we're seeing more and more people approaching dining is, is with a very kind of open-minded and open approach. Thanks, Lucy. That's, uh, I've had some of your cocktails. Delightful. Thank you. you did, yeah, try the new range that it's launching across everywhere next Tuesday, and they're really incredible. Um, we did a lot of work on that. I'm very proud of them. Oh, oh, I'll definitely do that. Thank you. Um, and Kate, I, I know you have a toolkit um, available, as, as Rahini was uh, saying, but uh, what, what, what other support do you provide to operators to help them market Garden Gourmet to their customers? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're, we're really keen not to just be a supplier, but to be a partner. Um, and I think that means uh, managing the end-to-end -end process with our, with our operators. So that's everything from insight around consumer behaviour, what the menu trends, what's coming up. 
Um, we've also got a brilliant team of chefs who are, are really keen to support on recipe and menu development. Um, they do a lot of work working really closely with the customer to develop um, what's best for that operator. Um, we've then got our marketing and category teams. We've got we've got brand, branded material and support. Um, and then we've got kind of got that, that technical expertise. So from nutritionist to quality and technical support um, to make sure that we're, uh, you know, giving you the best advice when it comes to um, nutrition advice, allergens, which we know is becoming a really hot topic at the moment. Um, yeah, so it's really about that end to end process. And then obviously we've got the, the, the people in my team, so the sales team who are there to kind of support the whole process through to supply chain as well. Um, and I think that's that's a really important point about that um, consistency in supply chain as well, because that can be um, that can be a problem, especially for the bigger operators. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of that end to end process and working as a partner. Brilliant. Thanks, Kate. And, uh, and, and Paul, um, I was on your website uh, uh, the other day, uh, not yours personally, obviously, but uh, Fuller's. Um, and I, I really love the dietary selection filters that you've yeah. got on there. I, I thought that was really helpful. But how else are you telling your vegan, vegetarian and flexitarian customers so, how great so I think is? I, I, I do lots of eccentric mad things, which when most of the team are head office, hear what I'm up to, they put their head in their hands. You know, I've dressed up as Willy Wonka just to make, you know, an open plan office. I, I, I never got the series The Office because we worked in rabbit cages in the old brewery. So now it's an open plan office. I've got this moment. I've got a stage every day to cause chaos. But uh, the cool thing about that is the whole marketing team uh, did the vegan journey. There's some avid vegans, um, you know, who, who follow the cause, which is great. So I have my own test bed. So I just you know, run across, you know, where have you been, what you're up to? And I think we, because of the youth of today, they, they you know, they have that open mind. They search. So. You know, we have that, but going back to the eccentric thing, we turned one of our pubs in London into a fully vegan, basically, offer. Um, the ops manager went vegan, uh, has been for nearly, I think it's going up to two years, um, and we painted it green. And I, not like in paint, we put covering on it or something, so it looked like a garden. And the sales went through the roof. It, and it was, it was amazing how what we learned from the excitement, you know, whether it's cocktails, people's interest, uh, we, we also had a bit of flack because people who'd used this venue for some, some time, where's my burger gone? Where's my steak gone? Where's my, you know, Friday choice? So we've got a balance now, but the menu is 70% predominantly uh, plant-based. Um, and even two of the chefs in there are eating. So, you know, we go to that extreme to learn from that and then use, you know, the brand is a, is a, is a superior brand, but everyone knows our business is by the pub. So it's the pub's offering this experience and look what we've done here. And that's how we then talk to our customers. But you know, who would ever think that a 90% vegan based marketing team could actually be on your doorstep to help elevate everything we do and having, a, and having assets which we get allowed to turn into a vegetable garden to, to challenge sales. And I think that's what we try and do. It's, it's surprise and delight our customers in a way that they don't see us as a pub. And it's, you know, we are fun and we are exciting. So it's bringing fun and excitement back to what we currently have. We use the people we've got. Brilliant. Can I come and work for you? Sounds really good fun. <laughs> um, and David, can you share with us some of the, the great work that Sodexo is doing on, on marketing, which I think you've, you, you've touched on briefly? So yeah, I think, well, I guess building on some of the others, um, you, you know, the idea that, um, uh, you know, often work-based catering and, uh, you know, different environments, now digital and app-based marketing is, is particularly important. And, you know, reaching, I think the last year probably has done it as well, you know, reaching people uh, from afar, whether they're working at home and coming in occasionally, uh, or just giving them information to help them make choices uh, ahead of their purchase or, or to get them to think maybe uh, slightly differently. So, and I guess this all goes back to as well, the idea that, you know, plant-based it's deeply connected to people's desire to do something better for the environment as well. Um, and if they can do that in a way that knowing what they are eating or consuming or drinking is doing that for them and making small inroads, then I think we're helping them make decisions and choices that they're happy to make. Uh, and so the idea of toolkits, we've also you know, very much uh, done, done a lot of work with the World Resource Institute and. Uh, looking at you know the menu language we use so there are toolkits now launched across our business for our chefs and managers 
to help them understand that the wording and the positioning of wording can either turn people on or off making those decisions. Um, and it works really well. Uh, and in fact, we're just launching some toolkits for teachers in schools and parents and our teams to help them drive a street food initiative um, in, the next, in the next term when they come back. And the idea there is, again, the food they're eating or thinking about eating, they'll know more about why. Uh, and that's really important from, from an education point of view. So just one, one marketing example. That's really great. I, I love that thought about it's really important that they know the why. Mm. Um, that, that's, yeah, that's very thought provoking. And Salima, um, could you share with us how you support your, um, your Absurd Bird and K, K Box uh, customers in terms of marketing? Yeah, so again, I think we're very different. We're, so, we're purely focused on food delivery. And there are certain things that we've decided, which is we don't want to shout about um, plant-based credentials. We want to shout about amazing food. And so a big no-no is don't talk about vegan. Um, it's such a polarizing word that uh, can put a lot of people off. So we refrain from using vegan. We use plant-based a lot more when we need to refer to it. Um, we like to highlight things like flavor and taste and how it feels in your mouth. So using words like mouth-watering um, or emphasizing, you know, the spice of a particular vegetable. So I think those are more important things than, than the emphasis on, um, on the fact that it's plant-based. Uh, because let's face it, it's just really good food. It just doesn't have any meat in it. And that's the thing that we're saying in our, in our mantra in our company um, is VOW, which stands for vegan once a week, which is, um, we're trying to get people and entice them one step at a time. Once you've tried something and you're wowed by it, you're going to try it again. And so for me, it's more important than talking about plant-based is maybe talking about origin of food. And I think people are much more interested right now in knowing, is it local? Where does it come from? Um, and, and knowing exactly what's going into their stomach. So I think it's less about, for us at least, um, showing that plant-based can be fun, can be cool, can be delicious, um, as opposed to saying it can be healthy, it is better for the environment, because we all know that. So we don't want to preach to our customers. We want to show them that actually this is really great food. And by the way, it ha and we do taste tests, by the way, I do blind, blind taste tests. In fact, I've had Lorraine in, in the restaurant doing a taste test and gave her chicken nuggets and she just had no idea it was plant-based and said it was probably the best chicken nugget she'd ever had. Um, so I think there is this, uh, this notion of uh, don't, uh, don't emphasize, overemphasize and don't preach to your customer, emphasize the things they care about, which is the taste, where it comes from, the quality of the food. So, so that's how we approach the marketing. Brilliant, thanks Salima. That's wonderful. I, lo I love the vow, um, the, the you know the the, fra the phraseology. So uh, that, that, that's great. Thank you. So moving on to the final uh, element of the discussion, um, I think uh, David mentioned earlier that it's fair to say we're experiencing a plant-based boom. The question is, will plant-based menus take over the restaurant industry? So so what are your predictions and why? So Paul, can I start with uh, with your views, please? Yeah, I think I think it's 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 as simple as it's it's going to be a stable a stable core expectation to have a really good, exciting uh, dish that's relevant, whether you're a you know a, a plant based vegan or vegetarian or however it works. But I think you know it's here to stay. I think a lot more of the focus will be on the sourcing and 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 sort of uh, CSR behind products. And the well-being you know there's lots of noise in the press around the almond uh, farming and, and avocado stuff in the press but i think a lot of this stuff is is the known so there's no surprise here but i think during lockdown people have had time to research further what they eat and actually get closer to what's going on in, in, in the environment so i think that will be key going forward and i think the final piece is there's lots of noise around nutrition and calories coming onto menus i'm an advocate of it. i think it's great because you know, you should see what you eat and should understand what goes into it. And I think let's not be fooled. Some of the basic uh, vegan dishes are quite high in calories. So I think, you know, people will, will become uh, a lot more wiser and it will challenge us to be more innovative and uh, do the right thing to get the balance. So, so I'm a huge advocate um, and it's here for the stay of the core, core part of our business. 
Brilliant, thanks, Paul. And David, where do you see plant based going? Uh, I guess up, really, um, ultimately. Um, again, just mirroring what others have said as well, that, you know, the idea is that we know it's exploded, we know it's going to be, um, you know, a journey that we're on and, um, and it's going to go from strength to strength. But to Paul's point, actually, and very strongly, I think, you know, the health and well-being piece has got to be front and centre here. You know, we're now getting into a situation as the UK in developing, finally, you know, a clear UK food strategy. Uh, and it's going to be important that we align with that and we support that. Um, maybe there'll be different, you know, reasons for agreeing or disagreeing with certain elements of it. But the idea that we can improve people's health, we can improve the environment, we can make sure that we're looking at the land that we produce food from in a, in a better way uh, and improve, you know, and also reduce food poverty among a growing uh, population of, of people in that, in that situation is, is, is the way forward. But I think actually this is, I'm going right back, I think Paul mentioned at the very beginning and, and right back to meeting the future needs. We've got to make sure that if we want to change behaviors within the industry, that a whole new education program is required and re-educating our chefs and educating our chefs so that they understand that that new way of thinking and that new approach to food and plant-based food um, is vital and, and to be able to deal with it properly is going to be is going to be key so working with apprenticeships and uh, and you know pitch training and the humane society we've just launched a, a plant-based qualification um, there as well and and the idea is that we, again back to partnerships with our suppliers if we're all on this journey together we're going to evolve together um, and just really finally um, I was just thinking about this and uh, a chef a very very well-known chef years ago said to me to create great food is a race without a finish and I think the more you think about that actually we're constantly evolving and if we can do that with health and well-being and, a, and you know, attention to our environment and our world in mind. We're going to, uh, we're going to have a great future. That's great, thanks, David. And uh, Lizzie, can you share your predictions? So, uh, where I work across our restaurants, I, I'm factoring in kind of the the brand, the consumers, uh, consumer trends, as well as the kind of food development piece. And I think it's very interesting seeing this in parallel with. Um, the kind of one of the biggest concerns that we had a few years ago, which was this kind of rising gluten free. Um, and I think it's interesting for me that that obviously comes with um, you know, people with kind of genuine issues, but I think that it, it also was a bit of a kind of trend. And I think somebody earlier in the discussion talked about how plant-based is, is not a trend, it is a kind of culture shift. And I think that um, where gluten-free may have sort of reached its peak I think that uh, plant-based will become this this shift in in the way that we eat out that is is more than just the food on the table and I think that both David and Paul touched upon the other areas which is uh, welfare and sustainability and health and I think that plant-based kind of encompasses all of these things and certainly for us as a business uh, sustainability is a huge part of where we're going and what we're doing and um, supply chain and um, where, where we get our products from and, and what they're packaged in. And I think that that all feeds into it. And that's where I see our customers moving towards rather than it being a kind of way to eat a few less calories um, or to kind of have a so-called kind of healthy lifestyle. Brilliant, thanks Lizzie. And Salima, what, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I think the writing's on the wall. I agree with everyone. This is a cultural shift. I mean, if you look at the record number of um, companies being funded in this space, uh, I think there's more investment in the first quarter of 2020 than the whole of 2019. Um, it, it's just unbelievable what's happening. Uh, I think we've got hundreds and hundreds of kitchens across the country. Um, we see it every day, right? We put a plant-based item on our um, our menus and it flies off the shelf. Um, so I think uh, there's no turning back. It is a cultural shift. It's not a trend. Uh, it is, I wholeheartedly agree with what everyone is saying is that, but, and by the way, vegan food is not necessarily healthy, right? Um, it depends how it's done. So I think uh, what's been really heartening for me is that my chefs came to me and they've worked in some of the most iconic restaurants in the world. 
and said to me, I want to focus, they want to focus on plant-based food because it makes them more creative. And they're much more excited about innovating in the plant-based space. And look, when Eleven Madison Park went entirely vegan, I think that was a, a cultural moment, right? And a massive shift when the, the most iconic restaurant in the world decided, you know, when they reopen, they go, they go plant-based. So um, I think it's a tsunami about to hit us uh, and we should all be prepared for it. Brilliant. Thanks, Salima. And finally, Kate, um, you've invested in plant-based uh, with Garden Gourmet. Uh, where do you think uh, the market is heading? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I can add much more to what everybody else has said. It is going to be a cultural shift. I mean, we've got we've got fairly big um, operators saying to us that they've got an ambition that their entire menu will be plant based in, in, in the next coming years. So um, it's not going anywhere. I think I think we'll start to see it come across more categories. I think uh, it'll go deeper into categories. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not going anywhere. And, and like everybody said, that's what that's where if, you, if you're a if you're a smart investor, that's where you've been putting your money. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. So before we go into questions, uh, I'd, I'd just like to sum up some of the key points that um, I've been uh, hearing. Uh, the first is innovation. Uh, the fact that consumers want to eat something new that that, that comes across very, very clearly. Uh, fundamentals, good ingredients, cooked well, um, the importance of suppliers feeding into innovation, especially those smaller, exciting suppliers that Lizzie mentioned, uh, the importance of data and research, um, insight, digital, uh, and I think Paul mentioned that, that lovely phrase, bringing excitement to the table. Um, and uh, as David said, it's really important also to know why and then I think uh, Salima summed it up brilliantly, brilliantly when she said it's a tsunami and a cultural shift so thank you very much panelists that was a really interesting discussion for me and I'm sure it was for for the audience so I'd like to now look at uh, the questions that are coming through um, the, the first one actually Rohini um, uh, I'd like to uh, ask this one to you, please, from Lydia Stratton. Hi, yes. Hi there. So uh, Lydia is saying, um, from a marketing perspective, do you see any consumer interest for labels on provenance uh, of imported fruit and veg? Um, basically, she, she's asking about the importance of labeling and wanting to know, uh, you know more about where um, where the uh, plant-based food is, uh, you know, coming from? Um, yeah, it's it's a really good interesting question. And um, I do think there is a growing interest. And I, I kind of took that as not just necessarily uh, restricted to packaged goods, but just f food in general, fruit and veg in general. I do, and, and um, probably without going into it, Brexit has kind of elevated a little bit that discussion around where our producers coming from. So yes, I absolutely see a growing interest in um, in consumers wanting to know where, where their food is coming from. And this is a really tricky one because um, with, with things like fruit and veg, it's easier to have that um, very simply and a bit trickier when you've got uh, manufactured products which uses ingredients from, from different places. And uh, I, I guess a connected question that's come through from Susan Bolam, she's asking, do you think signposting the carbon footprint of dishes will make it onto menus? Um, I don't know who wants to take that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. I think it will. Um, we're, we're already, um, in fact, we're having a, a conversation with our supplier about helping us with that. But I think customers are going to increasingly demand it. So we as a company are now very much focused on trying to, to um, bring out for each menu item what the carbon footprint is, and then to offer um, an offset so customers can actually offset that um, um, through, uh, through, through paying for it. So I do think it's gonna happen and we're certainly looking at it quite closely right now. Brilliant, thanks. And, um, uh, uh, Thomas Garash has come in uh, with a question saying, are vegan consumers concerned about their cross-contamination 
at the preparation point, e.g. plant-based items getting uh, in touch with meats. Are there any concerns? Like it to... is something that we've um, that we've had to look at, um, and with small kitchens, it can be a bit of an issue. I know that we did a lot of work when we decided to make our fries in Hache vegan, because you're then having to work out how you have a gluten-free fryer and a vegan fryer, and how you've got a whole range of <laughs> fried products yeah. and where you put what into which. Um, so it, it is definitely a concern, and it's certainly a concern for us that we don't want customers to think that it's not something that we take seriously. So we do have a separate griddle for the, um, the vegan patties. Um, similarly in Cabana, um, outside of plant-based, um, we have a big halal community who go to Cabana. And so we've been very careful of cross-contamination with the pork-based dishes as well. So I think that again, this is another part of the discussion as we see with lots of other food trends, again, gluten-free and lifestyle choices that you just have to kind of battle your way through. But it is certainly something that people uh, are considering. Brilliant, thanks Lizzie. And, and finally, a question from Peter, which is a rather long question from Peter Backman. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and uh, uh, summarize it. But basically, um, Peter was saying, you know, we, we, we've had kind of plant-based pizzas, uh, you know, we've had meat, meat pizzas, but we've never really categorized, um, you know, pizzas as being plant-based. Um, so his question is, uh, to what extent is the growth in plant-based due to our actually looking for it and, and changing how we define plant-based? I think just a quick uh, comment on that, Anita. Um, I, I get where Peter's coming from, but you know, to shift again, we're back to shifting behaviors from a traditional approach to food to a new approach. And, and actually small incremental changes can make it really easy for somebody to go, I'll try that. They're not confronted with this big problem to deal with going, I really want a steak and I'm going to have to go for this alternative. Here, it's, it's friendly, popular, cool food that just takes that box along that part of the journey. And it's not all those those people are eating. It's part of that bigger diet. So, I, I think I think it works really well. Brilliant, thanks, David. And I think if I can just echo that, I think Salima covered it. It's about how you word that dish. And I think you know people leave a, a restaurant or an experience with with memories. And I think it was. Do you remember that dish? That then helps the shift change. They they try at home, and you know you could just look at TV programs. So I think that shift's coming but it still comes down to the individual to make the first step and then the following will grow. And I think that is the key principle is you can't force things, but you can inspire the, the communities we, we cover or the employees um, and through marketing to tell people a story that they'd want to experience. And that's the key, I think. Thanks, Paul. There's a final question, uh, which links into that uh, sentence you just said about inspiring people to, to want to uh, explore things. And the final question is from Rebecca Harmon, who says, which sector is currently not represented as being strong in offering a plant-based um, offering? And how can we change this? Who'd like to uh, take that final question? I mean, uh from my point of view, I don't think there's I don't think there's any sectors that aren't trying to do it. Um, I think uh, some I mean, we have certain QSR customers that find it more difficult to do just because of their operational setup. Um, but they're still trying. I don't know. I don't know many sectors that that aren't offering plant based now. So I, I, I'm not I think I think we as suppliers need to need to help operators execute it. But then you've got the difference between plant based versus vegan, you know. Um, burger King in, in the US did a really good job of launching a plant-based burger and vegan it's cooked on the same griddle because they couldn't make it work operationally to be vegan um, but it's but it's a plant-based offer and actually I think it's been one of their most successful launches and it annoyed a lot of the vegan community but um, so I think that there's ways there's ways around it and that's where you have to differentiate differentiate between are you plant-based or are you a vegan offer and that's where it, um, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to hand back over to Lorraine, but I, I just want to say thank you for a really insightful and enjoyable session. Thank you so much. Thanks ever so much, everyone. Uh, that was brilliant. Really, really good discussion. Um, <clears throat> and a huge thank you to all of our panellists, uh, Rahimi, Paul, David, Salima, Lizzie and Kate for their 
superb insight. And thank you, Anita, once again, for being an excellent um, panel chair. Um, and also, I'd very much like to thank Garden Gourmet for, for supporting us today and sponsoring, and also the insights that you shared at the beginning, Rohini. Um, these webinars, we, we're going to continue to do um, going forward, even though the market is opening and we're going to be back to our live events. But it's really important that we understand what you, our audience, want to hear and what topics you want to hear from. So there's going to be a very, very short um, survey that pops up in your browser um, when you leave today. It will literally take no more than one minute to complete. So it'd be really great to hear your feedback on what you thought of today, what you think we can improve upon, and also what you feel you'd like to hear about going, going forward. Um, and lastly, a very exciting piece of news, which some of you... Um, may not have heard, but after 14 months of no live events, Arena is hosting its first one next Thursday. And to say I'm excited is, is basically an understatement. Um, it takes place at Clifton House uh, from midday to four o'clock. Um, and it, the, the event is actually limited to 50 people. So guests have got a fantastic opportunity to actually catch up with industry friends and colleagues that they haven't seen in a long time. Um, and the event's also going to be outside. So all the information's on our website, www.arena.org.uk. I've still got about three tickets left. So if you are interested and you want to find out who's going and who you can meet, just drop me an email. I know some of you on here are going, um, you in our audience. So, so look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you once again for joining us. And thank you to our panellists and Denisa for hosting. So thanks, everyone. See you all soon, hopefully. Bye-bye. Thank you.